Hello and welcome to the last panel of today's uh, conference where we will talk about the technologies that power up the fintech revolution. My name is Zornica. I am the editor of The Recursive. We are a regional media that is covering the emerging tech ecosystems in Southeast Europe and we have um, contributed with to the fintech report um, by gathering some data about the venture capital investments in, in fintech. Um, I remind you that uh, you can download the report from the Bulgarian Fintech Association's um, web page. So it is my pleasure to host today's discussion today and our panelists are leading some of the pioneer companies in the fintech sector and they are also experienced leaders in the financial services. So um, they have been active participants in the evolution of the sector uh, as well. And uh, without further ado, I will present them to you first by starting with the gentleman joining us remotely. So uh, welcome Kalyan Rachev, founder of the international innovation company Vangavis and co-founder of the AI cluster and the Bulgarian FinTech Association. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, joining us online is also Dimitar Gurdjilov, who is the chief commercial officer of the mobile payment solution Settle Bulgaria. Hi there. Hello. Good to see everybody. And here with me are Angel Kunchev, founder and CEO of Bright, the IT management consultancy on the digital transformation of businesses. Hello, everyone. And Mikhail Mikhailov, co-founder and business development manager of the open banking startup Iris Solution. Hello. Hello. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. I hope it will be a fruitful discussion. But before we start, just to give some context to our um, viewers, um, let me share some interesting insights from the FinTech report uh, this year regarding the different types of technology that are deployed by the companies in the Bulgarian FinTech ecosystem. So big data uh, and data analytics seem to be um, the technologies that are applied the most as three-fourths of the companies uh, in the field use this as a tool to create more uh, personalized customer experiences. But less than half of the companies say that they are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the least explored technologies so far are blockchain and robotic process automation, as only 20% of the companies report on using them. So I suggest we start our conversation by, you know, talking about the um, implications of the technologies that you are using in your day-to-day -day operations. So, Angel, first to you, what are, uh, what are the opportunities that uh, the technologies you are deploying create for, for the businesses you yeah. serve? So, um, when we talk about technologies, it's a very broad area. And as we saw, there are a different level of penetration of those technologies throughout the fintech industry and uh, the industry in general. But I would like to focus more on the AI and machine learning because these are the two of the technologies that I see here that are more penetrated than in the other sectors. But what is the chance there and what are the opportunities uh, is a very interesting topic because first of all, uh, we believe and what we see is that actually they're developing completely different operation models. Those companies that uh, have the chance and also the persistence to implement AI and machine learning, they really manage to change their operation models in three ways. So the first thing is that they can achieve big scalability because they're removing the people and the, the humans from the critical path of the operational processes. The second thing that they achieve uh, doing it this way is uh, the, the scope of the services that they can deliver. Because, you know, even if you deliver the most um, common service, it goes together with a loyalty program, it goes together with customer service and everything else. And through the AI, you can automate to a very big extent that and really broaden the scope of the service that you, can, uh, you are delivering to your customers and make a difference this way. And the third way to make really a difference when we talk about the operation model is the speed and the level of learning. Because uh, having uh, artificial intelligence that uh, you have a repetitive processes to update uh, those uh, uh, algorithms and make them better and better really shortens the time that you need in order to innovate because you are not obliged with um, the existing, um, let's say, operational hurdle when it comes to uh, people 
when you need to train them in order to follow new procedures, and then you can switch from one way of working to another way of working. But when you have um, AI uh, there, you can go in parallel with those two processes and choose from the one that goes better. And when we talk about AI, where it fits in the operational model, actually it fits in the decision making. So mm -hmm. it industrializes the decision making uh, and as we saw, uh, it's very often used in the, based on your survey. Uh, and compared, for example, for robotic process automation, it's very small. This means that all those processes are already automated by AI and you don't need to make a robo robots to replace human, in, uh, human actions. So uh, this is where we see the biggest improvement and once you have been able to automate this decision making from the operational model perspective, you can also change your business model because this gives you the opportunity to change the way, first of all, the companies generate value for their customers, but also the way they capture value for themselves. And this is not the traditional way that we are used to uh, so far when uh, you, in most cases, generate value and capture value from one and the same source. And in most cases, this is the end customer. But really, this um, technologies and the way you can change your operational model brings also opportunity to change your business model as well. That's really interesting. Can you give a specific example where, I don't know, you helped a client achieve better business results using AI? Yeah. Or so, change their business model, as you said. Yeah, yeah. So actually, this is a very long journey, if I have to be honest. So majority of our customers, I'm not going to use names, mm. but um, uh, one of the most prominent use cases that we have is, for example, in the area of um, cash management. Mm -hmm. And this goes into the finance and the other area that uh, we have very successful projects is in logistics. Uh, also, customer segmentation of any kind, when uh, we can segment the customers at the time when you acquire new customer is already segmented. And uh, actually, if we split the AI technology into three areas, first the automation of decision making, right? And here we have a lot of use cases, especially in the fintech, when you start with uh, approval of loans, uh, animality, anti-money laundering solutions, fraud detections, and any others uh, that I already mentioned. But the others are personalization of the experience. So this is something else. And we have been able to uh, develop a solution for one uh, very big Bulgarian company in order to capture all the data that they collect from their interactions with the customers in order to be able to start building this personalized experience uh, for each and every customer because this is the key. And this is what we not only believe, but what we see uh, in the practice that actually the customers want personalized experience in their interactions, not only with uh, the, the um, uh, Facebook and the other modern technologies, but also with the interactions with the most common services they use, and the finance is one of those. And the third area is personalized offerings. And in order to know that, you need to capture, and we saw that the big data is very big amount of uh, the respondents' uh, answers, and the penetration is very big. But this data should go around also the customer's preferences, customer experience, and their behavior, in order to be able to cover all those three areas uh, that I mentioned. Thank you. And Mikhail, what are some of the use cases uh, of data analytics when it comes to open banking? I think uh, Angel <laughs> mentioned all, everything that is possible to be done, but uh, not exactly, not exactly, of course. He was very specific in the details. Uh, you know, uh, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, it could be applied very uh, specifically in the open banking, in the bank sector. Because uh, our life is, we have a very clear photo of our life in our uh, financial behavior. By accessing the, this data for the open banking, we try to utilize this data to provide services first to the customers, second to the 
uh, different type of providers who can uh, only not only offer uh, specific and customized offers to the customers, as uh, Angel already mentioned, but to improve their knowledge about the customer uh, from risk perspective, uh, loans, KYC procedures, and IMLs, and to be more um, more close to the customer, to provide them uh, the services as it as the customer needs, because. Uh, you know, when I'll give you my, my favorite example is uh, I, I had to travel uh, somewhere abroad recently uh, and I bought a, a ticket with a plane and I paid the ticket and I went and I forgot to make my insurance, travel insurance. Mm -hmm. If I have uh, integrated open banking service, uh, my bank could read the transaction that I am buying a ticket. It means that I'm going abroad and probably I need such kind of insurance. And they can send me a push notification. Listen, you're going somewhere. Do you need an insurance? <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you remember to take this, uh, to, to bought this insurance? They've missed the opportunity, I've missed the opportunity. I take the risk to go somewhere, to having not cover the, the risk of something to happen with there, and the bank missed the opportunity, or any other company, uh, missed the opportunity to provide me this, this value for me. The good news is that there are companies in the fintech industry that are already doing that. <laughs> yeah, th this is a very yeah. uh, simple example, uh, very easy to explain, very yeah. easy to explain, that's why I'm mm -hmm. using it. Uh, of course, the, the scenario, there is hundreds of scenarios, uh, hundreds of scenarios that can uh, support all the companies who want to provide better services to their customers. Uh, they need data to learn more about their customers from all the perspective and to give them the, the value that the customer will appreciate. This is what open banking do. This is what we, by accessing the data, by implementing the, the power of uh, AI and machine learning, uh, this is what we can support these kind of companies. Thank you. I'm curious here, Dimitar, um, how do you apply technologies to analyze and predict customer behavior in, in e-commerce? Um, I think that um, I would start a little bit um, with, I mean, I think that um, the other panelists are way smarter than me. So, you know, they've said it all when it comes to technology. So I think that um, our approach at Settle has been quite interesting because we are probably one of the first fintechs, I mean, out of Norway, uh, when fintech was not what it is today. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, if we would recognize this almost like a, uh, fintech revolution that's been happening over the three or four years. I mean, you know, we started when that was not such a widespread knowledge and phenomenon. Um, and we started in a very simple way. Um, so we had to in, invent and reinvent ourselves. And, you know, for us, um, a lot of the technology improvements, a lot of what is now given, you know, taken for granted, did not even exist to, to a huge extent. We started with a synchronous, a synchronous processes in customer identification and various other things, and over time we had to evolve. What basically, however, is underlying all of these uh, improvements is they are not self-serving. They're typically focusing on either uh, meeting better customer, you know, client needs, or to um, simplifying to to, um, you know, making business processes uh, better. And the ultimate impact is that actually you either improve the customer experience and you serve people that are admitted by the financial, the traditional financial players, so you actually end up doing it in a more scalable and cheaper way. Um, I think that our approach has always been to focus on very simple things, you know, like, uh, looking at the customer journey and trying to see if there is a particular aspect of it that is not working properly. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is no wonder that, you know, over time we had to change our go-to-market strategy. And, you know, we're finding the biggest success right now in e-commerce because actually um, on the back of, you know, a number of processes that we've been improving over time, uh, we have ended up creating a one-click experience experience and and in that part of the world especially in southeast europe e-commerce is like really uh like 
so outdated. I mean, like eighty percent of transactions have well, of of purchases happen through cash on delivery. The penetration of e-commerce is so um, so far behind compared to other parts of the world, and 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 it's quite interesting that actually. Uh, like we have studied over the last few years, you know, why, you know, and, and very often it goes back to a number of objective reasons, uh, I like there's still a very big portion of the economy which is great, so people have do get cash outside of the financial system. Uh, the second one is actually fear. People uh, do feel that they expose themselves by plugging in their Credit card or debit card numbers in you know in, in social security and you know uh, this is a big issue and finally inconvenience. I mean the the whole um, drive toward more security has created a lot of obstacles in actually completing a transaction, which is which is increasing massively the drop rate. I mean you know this is one of the big issue with e-commerce players is that actually very often transactions which have started through non-cash payment route, they don't end up with a, an actual transaction. So what we have actually been doing is something very simple. Our ask was, can we create the one-click operation where after, uh, and, and that starts with actually working with merchants. I mean, uh, we have provided a way in in a very simple, through our API uh, documentation to, to make it very simple for even smaller merchants to get to, to start accepting mobile payments. So, you know, you have to break that one barrier and we have done that through continued improvement of our software and documentation so that basically even the smallest merchant can be, start accepting our method of payment. And then the second part is that we have created the process which where people, when they complete their transaction, when they click on settle, is just one fingerprint away for them to completing transactions. It's a seamless, there's no a lot of data you need to provide. Um, and, and in a way, um, we have resolved a very simple solution. Uh, I think that um, in this way, through um, most of most of the uh, machine learning aspects we have applied in our business model are around risk management, for example. Uh, I think that uh, around providing specific offers to people. I mean, obviously by interconnecting merchants and, and uh, consumers, we are, we are capable of offering very customized offers. But at the same time, I'll be the first to, to acknowledge, we're really far from actually fully automating what we're doing. There's still a lot of human factors. So we're just, we're doing, we're doing baby steps, fixing one simple issue at a time um, and, and hoping to actually become needed by our customers. So in a way, uh, I, I'm, like I said, we are really far from being super, I mean, it's no wonder FinTech is still not deep tech, right? I mean, you know, we're considered to be more followers and, you know, trying to, to, to basically use the best of breed, examples from software, from machine learning and all of these things. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't know if that answers well, this question, uh, but uh, that's where we're coming from. We're thank you for thing. yeah. Thank you for touching upon you know the challenges that you're facing building fintech solutions. I uh, will like to uh, jump back jump back uh, to that uh, at a later point. Um, but I want to ask uh, Kaluyan because he's you know a person who is involved in two ecosystem organizations, so he has a wider perspective. Kaluyan, in your view. What kind of technologies do you expect to see implemented uh, more and more by fintech companies in Bulgaria and in the region, more um, generally speaking, um, in the next year or so? Well, from a technology point of view, I think uh, in, in general, not only in fintech, uh, in my experience at least, uh, Bulgarian in the region comes... Um, a couple of years later than Central Europe, which comes a couple of years uh, later than UK and the US market. So this is uh, this is a development you can follow uh, in a lot of industries, and I've experienced it all my life actually. You know, on a, as a consumer and as a 
uh, and as a provider or, or, or uh, in that direction. Uh, that is not a bad thing, actually. That is a good way uh, so you can predict the future uh, of Bulgaria. So uh, in most of the cases, we will adapt uh, the, the winners of the, of the uh, te technologies uh, in Central Europe, US, UK, maybe from, from, from Asia. So we do a little bit of leapfrogging. And in best case, uh, we adapt the best solutions without making the mistakes uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the first movers. So it has, of course, positive and negative sides. Um, regarding specific technologies in general, which also will come uh, to the region, uh, of course, um, uh, cybersecurity will, will be a general issue in, in technology. Um, all, the, all the topics uh, with uh, biometrics uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, related uh, solutions are heavily uh, promoted by, by big uh, ecosystem players. Um, embedded finance is a, is a general trend which will uh, come more and more. Uh, for for the fintechs, uh, but also as it is, uh, uh, the, the nature of the, of this development is uh, it will be embedded in non fintech uh, companies. So this will be the lines between the industries uh, will blur. So telcos become banks, uh, uh, energy providers become whatever they want. Uh, so there is a big mix of. of uh, of industries and technologies, and uh, every technology can mix uh, with, uh, with the other. Um, there will be more uh, gamification uh, approaches, uh, for sure. Um, uh, some neobanks, uh, for example, like N26, uh, will try to join the market as they failed in the US. Now they turn more to Europe and to, uh, to the CE region, so they will also uh, uh, be looking uh, to implement new solutions or, or hire new, 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 new talents. Um, so this is, I think, a short overview uh, for the for the near time. In the f far future or not so near future, we can expect maybe also some fintech in the metaverse of Facebook or uh, in similar virtual worlds. But this is maybe not in the next two years, but who knows nowadays, things develop develop fast. Thank you. Thank you for this glimpse of the future. Um, it looks bright uh, from my <laughs> from my point of view. Um, you've mentioned cybersecurity and, and digital fraud, you know, as a main threat uh, as a, in the fintech sector in general. So, um, Angel, for you maybe, can AI be used as to solve this problem? Or do you see it as a threat in some instances as well. So uh, in general, as I said, uh, the AI is here to replace some decision making made by people. So uh, I would not say that there is a good and bad technology. There is a technology mm -hmm. that is used for good and technology that is used for bad. So definitely AI could help and uh, especially when we talk about cybersecurity and the number of threats are growing and the number of uh, endpoints and uh, uh, not only devices but and services are growing very fast so without AI I don't think that we can manage this uh, in a proper way but when it comes to challenges uh, I would rather focus on the challenges that uh, stands uh, in front of AI when we start implementing AI in general mm -hmm. and they go into several areas because if we start with business for example what business wants from a AI solution is first of all explainability. They would like to know for every particular um, algorithm what actually it's doing, right? So the, 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 the time of black box solutions is over. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is the governance. So uh, the business wants to ensure that every step of the uh, AI and ML process is monitored, is governed, and it's uh, go according to the standards and procedures. So this is on the business side. Uh, of course, uh, the, the algorithms should work uh, as they expected to work, but these are, uh, so let's say, the business concerns that we need to, to tackle most. The second thing is that, um, as I said, AI could be used everywhere, uh, and it's not a secret. Uh, but the challenge here is that in order to have um, 
good uh, algorithms, good solutions, you need data scientists. And at the moment, the number of data scientists is um, very small compared to the demand for, uh, for AI and those capabilities. And when we talk about capabilities, we can divide the capabilities that the data scientist has into another three areas. So first of all, those data scientists need to know deeply maths and statistics, mm -hmm. right? The second thing is that they need to, to know some languages, development languages like Python R or some others. So this brings to, right? But the third, and I would say one of the most important is to know the business mm. and the subject area that they're going to apply their knowledge. So actually to have all those three in one basket is very complex and very long development journey. And here is the second challenge, not only to the industry in general, but also to the uh, companies that are developing AI or automated AI platforms, is to democratize the process of AI and machine learning. Actually, to bring those capabilities to uh, people that are not proficient in AI. Actually, to give a chance to business people and to business analysts to develop their own uh, algorithms to be able to easily deploy them and of course monitor their performance. And the third area is when we come to performance to operations of the machine learning models. And when we talk about models, they have their path from data collection to uh, modeling of the models and then operating, meaning to monitor their behavior and their accuracy. And all this needs to be automated and transparent in order to be able to make this at scale and also facilitate this learning that I mentioned beforehand. So these are the main three challenges that needs to be solved in order to have a proper a really AI at scale. And the good news is here that there are already platforms that could deliver that, but really what we need to do is also to educate the community that it's already here. Uh, because there are a lot of people that um, uh, definitely follow the trends in the industry, but sometimes we, we are not that open to the automation of the automation, and this is happening today. And I believe that it will uh, speed up the development and, uh, of the solutions, but also the development of uh, the community and the, to bring additional solutions, because we are moving away uh, the people from the center of this evolution and the development of the solutions because we can bring those capabilities to the business and the business analysts. Thank you. Um, Mikhail, do you also face the lack of trust, I say, uh, to say, in businesses to open up to these new technologies or um, understanding them? Yes. <laughs> Not to the technology. Uh, because... Um, the, the area where we operate, the open banking, uh, it follows, no, it's open, open banking. Uh, it means that uh, someone s should share something. He will open something. Uh, even yesterday we had a very interesting meeting with uh, the CFO of a huge, uh, huge holding here in Bulgaria. He said, you know, I'm not ready to share my data. <laughs> uh, I said, why? You can share your data and you can share clearly to these guys or to this institution who will provide you additional value and you're sure that you're uh, providing your data for the specific services and you will receive additional value for that. Uh, because currently your data is locked. It stays there, it's taking a nap, it's not working for you. Mm. Uh, and still, still it's an issue. It's not only here uh, for our market. We, we observe what happens uh, in our area in uh, in whole EU, and not only. Even in countries where uh, the market is more mature, still part of the population, the companies, are not ready to share their the data. Uh, for instance, the last review I think we read was from Netherlands. Still, 30% uh, of the people there are not ready to share their data to third-party providers like us, which is okay. Which mm -hmm. is okay. People should have something in their mind to prevent themselves. Uh, okay, I'm sure that they share their data with Facebook, <laughs> with all the networks, uh, and uh, there the, the machine learning is working very quick and uh, very efficiently. 
uh, but they do it on voluntary. And probably this is still the, the business model which is going to persist for the next, let's say, probably a couple of years. But after that, the people in the business will learn that uh, they can use their data for, with their control for their own uh, value. We need time. How do you how do you educate both customers and consumers in in, in oh. this sense <laughs> to, to, to share to trust more to open access uh, we, to data? We, the first uh, we joined with the initiative uh, organized by the Bulgarian fintech association by the Sofia University. Uh, we participated in the um, in the classes because we know that it was more easy to educate the young people. You know. It's much easier. It, it makes sense to educate them because they are the early adopters. They can uh, use um, in their life uh, this kind of services, and this will change their life actually. Uh, but this is a long period. This is a long period and uh, a, a tough process. We we face even uh, uh, people who work in the bank industry. They still don't understand what is happening. Uh, how it works, why it's working like that, it will take time. Mm. It will take time. I think that it might take more time for them. And this is something that I'm uh, looking at the market. Um, because at the moment, the incumbent financial institutions, they have a portfolio of services that is uh, starting from, of course, uh, commercial market and goes to the business market, but you have all the blends. So from... Uh, traditional transactions, to loans, to more complex products and stuff like this. And what's happening at the moment, they're giving away some of those less profitable services to mm -hmm. fintech and to startups thinking about that they're not bringing them big profit. And they can easily, um, let's say, uh, give away them. Yeah? But uh, what is happening, and this is proven in the history of the industry in general, is that actually those startups, they're going to go up market. And this is the trend at the moment, because they're entering into loans, and they're going up, 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 and the banks or the, the incumbent financial institutions, they're going to focus more and more on the top level uh, services that they offer. And suddenly, it, Probably, if they're not acting at the right time, the first thing that will happen is that they will start acquiring, uh, let's say, more modern financial institutions. But uh, what the history shows is that because of the culture, they're not going to be able to embrace their business model. And probably a certain time it might happen that it's too late for change. And you, this you, have a, you have a fresh example. Today, Payho raised a certain amount of money at the market valuation of... 586 million, as far as I remember the figures. Uh, four years ago, or three years ago, uh, KBC bought UBB, which was third at that time, I think, for 60 million. So, okay, it was in euro, 60 million, six, 600 million, 600 million. Uh, Payhawk developing one services, exploring the, the abilities of open banking of data and all that, they created a business which is today uh, valued for 600 million. And we have a deal a couple of years ago, a huge bank, traditional bank with a lot of customers and a lot of services, but traditional, as you mentioned, for 600, uh, for the same price with thousands of employees, branches and all that stuff. So th the market is totally totally confirming what you're saying. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, probably the, the end of the game is coming soon. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying, because <laughs> the, the, the potential of the modern financial companies is biggest, great. It's, yeah. uh, it, it could not be shaped even. Yeah. And this is because the technologies that stand behind. As I said, when you employ uh, technologies like AI and everything that... Uh, uh, is available at the moment. You don't have limitation of scale. You don't have limitation of scope. You don't uh, have limitation of fast learning. And if we take those three and compare these three components to the traditional uh, financial institutions, they uh, have limits in all three. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this is the game changer. And um, I think that the end is near. But let's see. Mm. 
<laughs> Jumping on this thought uh, and maybe looking a bit towards the future and the next generation of, of consumers of uh, financial services, um, I'm curious, Kalyan, what's your opinion on how can we apply technology to understand you know, these new customers' uh, expectations and habits when it comes to dealing with money? Um, I'm talking about the Generation Z. There have been numerous studies already. How do they behave and what do they want from, from fi fi financial services? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I think the young people, the Generation Z, are uh, monitored uh, in, in a lot of ways from a lot of technologies. Of course, not everything is shared with, uh, with every fintech, with every bank. But uh, potentially there is enough data uh, even to, to predict uh, to predict their their behavior, so uh, so predictive analytics and marketing automation are where also AI is used uh, might be a good uh, or a, a, a fit a good fit to to uh, to do this to uh, get this goal. Um, of course, uh, all the the payment and retail and e-commerce, mostly e-commerce, uh, when we uh, talk about online uh, payments. Uh, this is this can also be tracked and uh, uh, the, the the behavior can be can be monitored and uh, develop uh, analyzed. So this might be uh, here uh, technologies to to operate with the generation Z. Mm. Uh, we need uh, uh, and this is where also the Bulgarian fintech association uh, has a clear goal to educate uh, the the people's of financial literacy starting from a young age uh, to, to uh, that means children to students and even uh, even adults financial literacy uh, with uh, the combination of uh, te technological literacy in, in finance uh, are also key um, uh, for, for the future of, of, of every customer uh, and uh, generations that will be more prepared if we talk also about digital money crypto and all these things but still uh, also, fr from from very early age to to, to, to adults, we have to uh, educate uh, uh, people. And all, here, the Bulgarian fintech association ever has a strong uh, strong pillar where we do this uh, on a uh, on a level with universities, as mentioned, uh, with Sofia University, but but also uh, for a general public. I think this is also a very important uh, topic. Thank you. And Dimitar, maybe the same question for you. How do you apply technologies to learn more about, you know, the new consumers' habits and expectations? Um, I, I would actually add to, to Kalyan that, um, in a way, um, perhaps the general, the, the Generation Z the, uh, would be the reason why the people on this call will be disrupted. <laughs> because uh, I'm going to bet that probably uh, like a, a Gen Z girl or a boy understand more about blockchain than some of the people on this call. So in a way, uh, in a more intuitive way, most probably. So I think that um, I, I think that basically um, the verdict is out there. I think that, you know, uh, too many too much research, too much understanding has gone on understanding millennials. So now it's time to like, oh, let, let's look at the the, the next big thing. Um, I, I do think that basically um, it is impossible to predict uh, where things are going to be in a few years. I do believe that blockchain is going to lead to rewriting the rules of the game. I mean, the same way in which we are actually short, I mean, you know, what are we doing as fintechs? We're, we're trying to streamline the process, to take as many um, intermediaries as possible, to, to, re, to, to, to make things more scalable, cheaper. Uh, and, and in this way, we are traditional, the status quo, the, the, the banks. Uh, and, 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 but then, um, you know, then again, uh, a blockchain transaction, I mean, I was just having discussions with, 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 a, with a great, um, you know, IoT company, like Internet of Things company, where we're trying to partner up. And, and, and they have already uh, built a transaction engine, which is costly. There's no cost to it, you know, which is based on blockchain. Because it, 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 these, are, these are a bunch of strings that exchange, and there is no cost to it. It's the, the same as the cost of an email or whatever, any other electronic communication. So... So basically, um, 
this we do not yet perceive how much this is going to change things in five or ten years, and it will be regulated eventually. And so, so I think that um, uh, we we should be using everything at our at, at our um, disposal right now in terms of machine learning, in terms of um, all the other ways to really listen to customers. But but basically, and be and be prepared to be to be disrupted. I think that um, um, we do exist because of our customers. We do exist to serve particular customers. Very, it's very rare we can serve everybody. Um, and and in a way, uh, I think that there will be a, a whole range of new companies that will probably be serving better. Um, Generation Z, you know, uh, girls and boys, um, you know, the same way we may be serving better millennials right now um, compared to banks. And and I think that um, um, and it will be exciting. It will be great. I mean, it will be it will be yet another fantastic day. Thank you. I would like to add yeah. maybe one thing that. Uh, uh, technology often like follows the the development of society. That's why it's difficult to predict because we can only assume in which reality the the young generation will live. Uh, what kind of value money will have in general? If they're gonna have general free income and uh, or if they have to work uh, uh, for money, uh, that uh, will money be. Uh, be actually the currency of exchange or, or some other aspects like attention or data, which can also be used as value. Uh, so these are very, very new types uh, where technology, of course, it shapes, but it also follows uh, the trends uh, of uh, and the habits of the young people. So if they say we want everything now, we want uh, to have it and to buy it later, uh, or if you want to invest with micro investments, te technology adapts. So the socio socio-economical trends uh, are also very important if we try to predict something. Mm, very good point. And how do you keep an eye on, 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 on these societal changes that are driving or driving technology trend uh, changes and then, you know, the way we operate and do business in general? So as Kawian already said, uh, we're in a <clears throat> better position being able to look what the others are doing because actually those trends are coming later mm. to us. But um, I would like to go back to what we all stated during the conversation probably in a different way, but the first and most important thing is to really know our customers. So we should not be blinded by our current success or even future success, but we really have to monitor the behavior of our customers and if I go back those three things, okay, uh, the automation of the operational process, but uh, the, the the focus on personalization is very important. But in order to have personalization, you need to know your customer. Mm -hmm. yeah? And personalization in any way. And what I may say for Generation Z is, first of all, that they don't perceive the money the way at least we perceive it, or I myself in pers personally. But also, uh, they, they see technology in a completely different way. So for them, technology is not a tool to do something. It's uh, actually uh, the way, well, yeah, well, way, of way of living. Yeah, absolutely. So and this is something that we need to embrace and be open to embrace it, uh, like the demand for every other customer and generation, because actually the old generation is evolving. So even our generation and our parents' generation, it's evolving within the time. And of course, um, the older generation is evolving and developing their uh, mindset and the cultural uh, aspects of that slower than the youngers. But actually, they're also adapting to these new realities. And this is something that uh, I also have to come to our attention that we don't need to judge only by generations, but also some trends that are related to some cultural aspects of that mm -hmm. and also uh, social aspects. Yeah? And in this regard, uh, I believe that uh, here in Bulgaria we need to put um, really uh, a lot of attention to the education uh, because um, 
in a lot of areas that we observe, uh, you have in big cities one way of perceiving all those new technologies and services that we are describing, but it's not the same in the smaller ones. And if we talk about Bulgaria, we are not, uh, let's say, uh, a consistent society at the moment, especially in terms of adopting new technologies and new uh, digital services. And this is something that I believe we need to change and to work upon, not only with the government, but with the whole society and more non-profit organizations. Okay, thank you. And to wrap up maybe this uh, conversation for today at least, although I would like to continue in the future talking about this, um, how do technologies, do you think, Mikhail, contribute to your mission to democratize money, let's say, in more general term? Without a technology, we will not be able to, to provide the services we provide. They're in the basic. Because, uh, uh, you know, in, in our solutions, we are all former bankers. You know, some of us uh, still remember the time when, uh, when you used to pay with cards, you have to use a device called a printer. You put the card, you use a slip mm -hmm. to print the card and to send the copy of the card to fax and to, to withdraw some money. We st I still remember the time. And I still remember the time when uh, everything was kept in, in the books. <laughs> uh, even I'm not, not so old. Uh, <laughs> now, banking is totally different. And this is uh, thanks to the, to the technology. And um, these technologies allow us to, to bring the, the banking, the power of open banking, the power of data, of new payment methods to, to a new level with no technology. Everything comes from the open source. The, the open source era, which started 20 years ago, now we all have uh, the mobile devices and all the services provided by the big companies. Now is coming the open banking as a part of open data, and it will continue. But without the technology, <laughs> no chance for that. Thank you. Dimitar, final sentence from you, maybe? I actually would probably, um, you know, finish with a little bit of more cynical comment uh, because, um, you know, I have seen a lot of flow in it. I mean, I've seen uh, as a as a former J.P. Morgan banker, I remember uh, that we were doing IPOs on a piece of paper back in 2000 and raising, you know, billions for um, five of the home startups. You know, and then a lot of them failed. <laughs> they went into bankruptcy. So I actually think that um, there there is a certain um, certain you know uh, stage of development, and sometimes you know technology gets ahead of you know its everyday implementation. And I think that. Uh, a lot, a lot of money now is going in, 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 into developing newer and cooler and very often repetitive apps and whatnot. And, you know, it is scary, but, you know, JP Morgan right now cannot buy, uh, like Chime. It's, it's, it's worth as much as possible. And they only have probably one millionth of their revenue. So it's just like, it, so some of it doesn't seem that sustainable. I think that, however, this is really, really, um, in such situations, it is really creating to make life better for some of the disenfranchised part of the society. I mean, for example, once again, and sorry to sound a little bit, uh, you know, as if, you know, trying to do some cheap PR, but like in the Bulgarian market, for example, there is like a huge amount of people that do not have a bank account, do not have a, you know, debit card, do not, they're, they're still operating, they're getting, you know, the majority of their income, um, you know, in cash. And, 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 and actually right now, nobody's doing anything for them. And, and actually, I do believe that simple technology improvements can help their kids jump over to, 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 to become, you know, proper digital natives and, and to become part of the financial system. And, and I think that um, this is happening around the world. And while some uh, of this money may not be 
you know, may go to waste and, you know, there'll be a bubble and there's going to be, in the meantime, everybody will get better. It, it, you know, in terms of access to finance, access, you know, like you said, democratizing, um, uh, that's what the fintech revolution is about, democratizing cash, access to credit, um, access to services, you know, um, maybe, uh, you know, like some sort of crypto stablecoin, whatever will end up becoming, will, will, will make the financial system around the world just as much accessible to somebody in Africa than, than in the U.S. And, and this is really, really exciting. So I'm, I'm super, super excited about what to follow and, you know, happy to see that, you know, even if some investors lose a, a little bit of money, a lot of people will benefit from this. Thank you. And Kaluyan, last words from you. Maybe how can we bridge this gap that Dimitar was referring to? Um, uh, I think uh, it was a, a good point uh, from Dimitar that uh, the, so we all know technology uh, is, is here to stay. AI, in my opinion, it's not here, uh, but it will it will come. Uh, but uh, uh, still, uh, we have to uh, face that also uh, even in banks, the the reality is that uh, it, and that's not only in, in our region. Uh, the processes are, are, are slower than uh, trend blocks and future predictions. And uh, in, uh, in our world that we see startups, investments, still there is the, the let's say, the real world, which is a, a couple of steps slower. And uh, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's okay. We're, we're moving uh, forward. Uh, the, maybe the fastest way will be the generation switch in general. So... This will, like it always was, the generations which will adapt uh, technology and uh, behavior much more faster than uh, than educating the, the, the adults and the elder, elderly, which of course will be educated, but the, the switches uh, will come also with uh, the switches in management, not only in consumers, but uh, with management uh, in banks and fintechs. So when the younger uh, come up to decision-making uh, positions. This also is a, a natural way of change. Thank you, and thank you all, gentlemen, for this fruitful discussion and for the glimpse into the future. And now I'll give the floor to Svetoslav Dimitrov, the Secretary of the Bulgarian Fintech Association, to wrap up today's conference. Uh, so it's a pleasure always to be in, uh, among such, such an experts. And... Um, I'm proud to be, to be actually uh, part of, of what, what's happening in Bulgaria, in, in all our um, society and uh, also in the ecosystem. Um, without the help of uh, not only us from the association, but without the help of um, other participants, other stakeholders, it couldn't uh, happen really. That's why I would like to thank to, for the support and for, for, for the active participation of uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, Financial Supervision Commission, European Commission, European Parliament, Invest Bulgaria Agency, Innovative Sofia, of course, all the panelists, uh, of course, all the attendants. Uh, it's hard to wrap up all uh, everything. We, event like that, it could hardly be wrapped up. Uh, what I could say is that um, <clears throat> I remember the days when the association became uh, like a dream between few enthusiasts and uh, actually today we saw few of these enthusiasts uh, uh, discussing on the topics. Uh, I'm very happy to see and I see it and I, I really hope that you also see it that during the years um, our organization become not only a association, uh, a proper association of the FinTech Society, but also become a, a cluster, um, a real cluster where you could uh, easily share your view, uh, take the opinion, exchange it, and uh, receive uh, the, the, the proper outcome. Um, I see the results of what we, we did in, in 2017, uh, the, the dreamers, let's call it like that. Mm. The today event again uh, remind me that 
we Bulgarians, um, we do our best and actually we managed to, to put uh, specifically the f uh, fintech, um, uh, Bulgarian fintech society uh, somewhere in the highest rank of uh, fintech uh, societies in, in Europe. And uh, that is something which uh, I am proud of and I really hope that you would be uh, proud of. Um, so let's, let's do it like that. Let's not uh, give up. We've got a lot of work to do. Thank you to all of you, and I need your support. We need your support, not only me personally. <laughs> Association needs your support to, to achieve uh, its, it, its goals. Thank you very much. And I also want, uh, would like to, to thank to our host, uh, uh, Interact127. Thank you very much.